All right, we're talking the NHL here on ProLine. Greg De Palma joining me, Jan Levine, who works uh, with uh, Rotowire, also Hockey News. He's been covering uh, the New York Rangers as well for a very long time. How's it going, Jan? Good, Greg. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, it's great to talk hockey again. It's been a while, but uh, – I guess, as they say, better late than never. And our teams still haven't won a Stanley Cup since we last spoke. So, but they've been very competitive. And that's all I guess all you can ask for is a shot. And the Rangers and the Vancouver Canucks uh, are definitely uh, competitors. Now, what we're going to do on this show is we're going to talk. It's our first show, of course. So what we're going to talk about here is the Eastern. We're going to start off with the Eastern Conference Futures. Uh, sort of like uh, the type of show we would have done in the preseason uh, and then our next show, we're going to cover the Western Conference. And then after that, uh, we're going to come on and talk about anything, including maybe go over some games uh, whenever we talk, maybe give you some predictions, things of that nature. So let's go ahead, though, and talk about futures, because this is where if anybody likes to wager uh, on uh, who's going to win the championship in hockey, uh, that's uh, this is hopefully going to be the video for you. So uh, let's, uh, first of all, take a look uh, at the standings. So I'm going to go ahead and pop that up here on the screen. And uh, let's uh, see what we got here. Yeah, let's just get this out of the way. All right, big surprise. Defending Stanley Cup champion Florida Panthers are back still in first place in the Atlantic. Uh, you got Toronto uh, right uh on their heels, the Boston Bruins uh, actually uh, off to a you know, kind of a sluggish 500-ish type of start. There are the Lightning, Ottawa, Detroit, Buffalo, Montreal. So let's start off here uh, with the Panthers division. Uh, how uh, What are you thinking about so far with the Florida Panthers and how they've been defending their championship this season? I mean, I think – there's no surprise Florida's an elite team and made it to the cup, made a finished eighth two years ago, made it to the cup finals last year, came back an improved team, um, won the cup, as we know, unfortunately beating my Rangers in the Eastern conference finals, and then went on had a three zip lead over Edmonton Edmonton, as we know, kind of rallied, brought it to a game seven. And then Florida found, got it, found a way to get a victory and raise the Stanley cup. And they're look, they're just an elite team. When you have Alexander Barkov, you have Matthew Kachuk, you have Sam Reinhardt, you have Ekblad, you have um, Sergei Bobrovsky. Um, but more importantly, they have an infrastructure, especially with Bill Zito as the GM and with their owner and with the overall infrastructure in their organization that, you know, that if they're close, they will find a way to add pieces. I mean, they did have some losses this year, Brandon Montour being the main one who went out to um, Seattle with a long-term deal. But Florida, in my opinion, is likely still going to be the elite team. Uh, they, had, had, they had Alexander Barkov missed a couple of weeks. He's come back. Matthew Kachuk's been in and out a little bit. But overall, I mean, if you're looking for a team to target in the Atlantic, I mean, they okay. are most clearly the team to target in the Atlantic. And no question as to why we'll see they're probably the favorite in the Eastern Conference as well to make yeah. a third straight appearance in the in the Stanley Cup. All right, what are they missing from last year's team? Um, well, as I mentioned, Brandon Montour is probably the biggie, right? I mean, that, that's yeah. that's most certainly the, the biggest name out of all of them because he was there. He was one of the main, main defensive guys. I mean, Aaron Ekblad's historically missed a lot of time. I mean, he's been probably injured more than he's been healthy, ironically, um, but the team overall has been able to make do with without him. I mean, the thing that I think is different this year is, I mean, Anthony, um, Anton Lundell stepped up with, with Barkoff out, um, showed he could be a true top six center if need be. I mean, they have Sam Reinhardt in that role. Wouldn't be shocking if they move one of those guys to wing every once in a while and kind of bolster. They're making do with, I wouldn't call it spit and bailing wire, but, but I think that when they're going to target, it'll be third and fourth line guys, give them a bit more depth bit more grit down the road. And then defensively, I mean, as I mentioned, losing Montour is a pretty big loss, but they, you know, they brought in Nico Mikola last year and he ended up being a fantastic addition. Dmitry Kulovkov has been fine. So there's pieces that they have there, but I do think if you're going to also add, it's going to be probably bottom pairing guys who also can play a heavy game. I mean, Florida likes, okay. Florida can play a heavy game. 
They have a lot of skill, but they're more than willing, as we saw last year, right? Every time there was a puck battle, seemingly after games one and two against the Rangers, they won all those battles. Games one through three against Edmonton, they won all those battles. So Florida does have skill, but they are a team that's willing to kind of pay a lunch pail type of a, type of a game, which benefits them when we get to the postseason. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at their competition. And you see Toronto there. Now, the biggest, a couple of big changes this year in Toronto, which is really for the first time in a long time, why I actually believe. And, and I'm saying to myself, okay, I can take Toronto seriously. And that is the addition of uh, a key defensive player and then most importantly, a head coach. Uh, so talk a little bit about whether or not uh, you agree that that maybe there is something different about this Toronto team that when they get to the postseason that you would have the confidence that they could actually win some, well, win a series, let alone, you know, win a few of them. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. So you, we had this whole offseason, the whole Mitch Marner question, right? Will he resign? Will he, will he not resign? And that's still a specter that's kind of looming over them right now. Um, it's one of those things where Marner's gotten off to an absolutely hellacious start and is showing that as of now he's worth the big extension that he wanted. And he's he's actually picked up the slack because Austin Matthews is injured. Matthew Nyes, who they who last year was a rookie, has show stepped up his game also this year. Um, William Nylander has kind of stepped up his game. Between the pipes has been interesting. So what's been a big difference is Anthony Stolarz, who is a backup. Ended up being the number one because Joseph Wall's been dealing with some injuries. And Stolarz actually was in Florida. So he's a pretty good, you know, not an elite guy, but he's a guy who can fill in periodically when need be. Um, we saw that this year. I still think Joseph Wall is going to be their clearly their number one blue, number one goaltender. But Stolarz is a guy who's been able to step up. But as you mentioned defensively, they added Oliver Ekman Larson. They added Chris Tanev to a monster deal, right? And last year, it's funny when everything was going on with, the, with them in the postseason and Dallas was making their run, the big thing was whether or not um, where Tanev would land. And Tanev landing where he landed is, is look, they pay a lot for him. And it's a long-term deal. But he is the type of guy that Toronto has lacked in the playoffs. He's a guy who yeah. can change a game with a hit, which is, as we talk about, you know, all the skills wonderful in the world, but you know as well as I do, when it comes to playoff times, you're not going to have a lot of time and space. You have to be able and willing to grind games out. I mean, you add in Jake McCabe on the blue line is willing to do that. Ekman Larson, who was in Florida last year, who's willing to do that. Um, Bobby McCann, et cetera. So um, that's, um, that's a lineup that's a little bit deeper now. Um, as you mentioned, new management, new philosophy. Um I mean, old coaches ended up in, ended up going to kind of Pittsburgh, ended up leaving. Their GM, Dubas, ended up leaving, right? They kind of got a whole new overall management structure overall, at least in terms of kind of the day to day operations, except for clearly Brendan Shanahan is still there overseeing things. But that's a team also that if they prove during the regular season, they can go toe to toe with guys. We both expect them, as Florida will be, is to be uber aggressive at the deadline, right? They will get into, but Boston is a shell of themselves a little bit. Tampa is a shell of themselves a little bit. So those two are going to be one and two when you would expect Florida and Toronto to probably meet, depending on what happens in the wild card, as a potential second round matchup coming out of the Atlantic division. So, so do you believe in this? Uh, do, do you uh, and them do, do, do you believe in this Stolars? Uh, because he's a good backup. Do I, do I believe he can step in? Yes, I do think. As a from a talented perspective, I do think that Joseph Wall is probably more talented. Okay, but but Stolars has a pedigree of playing on a playoff champion. He has shown he can step up and be a number one when needed be. But Wall he's never has he's never been a full time number one guy. Nope, not really. I mean, but but Wall, they're gonna, you know, he was dealing with an injury. They don't have to overplay him. They can allow him to kind of get settled. And he probably would have been the number one last year if he wasn't dealing with an injury as well. Okay. But I do think Wall is going to probably be the number one, but as, as you as we've seen before, right? Just because a guy is penciled in as the number one netminder. If Stolarz is playing out of his mind when the whole season rolls around, 
Yeah. Toronto's certainly going to roll the dice on Stolarz and figure, look, he's shown he can do it during the regular season. He's carried us. He's put us in the position where we are. We're going to stick with him. Granted, we have an enormous amount of time until April Yeah. Um, to see how this thing plays out. But nothing would sh- it wouldn't shock me if Stolarz goes into the playoffs as the number one either. Okay. So, and, and they're happy there. There's no reason to believe that they're going to look for a goaltender at the deadline. That These are their guys. This, this is what they're going to go with. Unless a guy like Mark andre Fleury became available and he was clearly an upgrade and Minnesota was looking to move on from him. And look, John Gibson is going to be out there. I just don't think Toronto is going to go for him given the length of his contract remaining and his, and his dollars okay. associated with the AAV of the deal. But I do think still they're they're happy right now with Stolarz and Wall. Come back to me at the end of February, right before the deadline, and it may have a different view. All right, and then Boston and Tampa; those are the other two teams uh, that have the history. As you said, Boston's off to a sluggish start so far, and I mean this is an indication right there. Uh, playing 500 hockey minus 11, that's not too good. What's the reason for their struggles? Uh, they lost Allmark. As the, as the number two who's in Ottawa right now because they traded him because of uh, the contract associated and the contract that he was going to want. Um, they also wanted to make Swayman in the number one. Um, but you look there, right, David Pasternak. But when you get past Pasternak, the rest of that lineup isn't scoring, right? Last year, Pavel Zaka and Charlie Coyle stood on their head. This year, both of them have kind of regressed to the mean a little bit and kind of come back to earth. They signed Elias Lindholm to be their number one, who's really a number two. He got off to a ridiculously hot start. He's kind of hit the skids. Cole Kepke is a guy who's not a goal scorer, and he's been playing sort of out of his mind right now, but he's not a guy to count on. Charlie Mark McAvoy's gotten off to a slow start himself. So you kind of go up and down the lineup, and there's lots of questions offensively, including Brad Marchant, who's had um, his struggle this year in terms of offensively and then defensively. McAvoy's been okay. They just lost um, Hampus Lindholm long-term, which is going to adversely impact their blue line, which is already a little bit weak to begin with. So Boston is one of those teams where they they usually the, – the sum of the parts is greater than the overall individual totals, meaning they're a better team collectively than they are individually. But eventually that may end up catching up with you, and this may be that season where it's catching up to them because if Tampa finds a way to finish third – and you get five teams that come out of the Metro, which could end up happening, Boston could find themselves on the outside looking in. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, the goaltending situation doesn't look very good at this point. I mean, these are bad. Wayman's a good goalie. He'll be, he'll be yeah. fine. He's just gotten off to a rough start, and he's clearly the number one. And when we get the Four Nations Cup, he could be one of the, the goalies for Team USA. But, yes, he's gotten off to a rough start this season. All right, Tampa Bay, I know it's been a few years. Uh, they, they seem to be one of those organizations. We see this in every sport where they have a dynasty going on, uh, and then they, 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 they're still competitive because they still have some of that, those dynasty parts there. But, you know, it just it's sort of like what we actually have been seeing the last several years or before that with Pittsburgh. I mean, you just eventually, you know, it, it goes away. How are they doing? Do you think that they've made a good enough – job to try to get go get back to being a championship team or are they still heading the wrong way well, i mean they 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 have andre vasilevsky in net so anytime you have a a vezina trophy type candidate in net you're usually in pretty good shape defensively victor hedman is still elite but they ended up losing mikhail sergachev this year and that's a pretty big impact on your blue line who's gone to utah and He's a he's a pretty darn good defenseman. He's probably number one. J.J. Moser has been pretty good. That's who came over. They re- ended up trading for Ryan McDonough and bringing him back, though he's clearly a little bit long in the tooth. We saw that Steven Stamkos ended up leaving and going to Nashville, but he ended up getting replaced by Jake Gensel. Uh, Nick Paul's been fine. So there are, you know, Braden Point, we know how good he is. We know, and Nikita Kucherov, clearly we know how great he is. And Brandon Hagel, even though they gave up a couple of number ones, was you can almost argue kind of stolen from Chicago given what we've seen out of Hedman. But then you start getting to the depth of that lineup, you know, third and fourth line, and you start having some question marks. Now, Anthony Sorelli's had a good year, and he's stepped up because Braden Point's been a little banged up. But like you said, once you start dealing 
from your prospect pool to yeah. make runs, right? They overpaid for Tana Janot, and he ended up being an absolute bust, and they trade him for LA for pennies on the dollar. Eventually, sooner or later, those things have a tendency to catch up to you. And look, their top six is still elite. Third line is meh. Fourth line is nothing special. They have some blue line depth issues that are clearly playing itself out. Do I think they're still probably finished third in the division? Probably. I think they're just too good of a team. I think part of it may have been dealing a little bit with the Steven Stamkos hangover because, you know, he'd been there, the captain for so long and seeing him leave clearly had an adverse effect. And now that they've had the game in against Nashville and put that to bed, I do foresee them making some runs, but the Atlantic is a better top to bottom division, except when you get to the bottom part. So they'll be in some battles, but I still think they have the pedigree to finish probably third in the division. All right. And uh, Montreal. Wow. I mean, uh, that's uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, they appeared to be an up and coming uh, franchise. I don't know what happened. We'll get into that. I guess discussion enough for another time. Buffalo always just seems to be Buffalo. Same thing with Ottawa. Detroit, I mean, what a miraculous playoff run they had last year. They just couldn't get it done at the last day or two. And, and you felt, well, they'll pick it up. That's promising. It doesn't look like they've picked it up. So out of these four teams, who do you give the best chance to make a, a run to the postseason? Um, it's tough. I mean, I think all of them have decent chances. I think I mean, Ottawa, by having Olmark and Net, solidifies their net mining, which has been a big-time issue. If Thomas Shabbat can stay healthy on the blue line and Jake Sand and Jake Sanderson becomes the kind of guy they expect him to be, that goes a long way in solidifying their blue line, which has been an issue. And then up front, like we talk about Matthew Kachuk, I mean, Brady's pretty good in auto as well. Um, they have some decent other pieces offensively there. So I'm going to probably go with Ottawa just because okay. of the fact I think overall their top six and their top nine is probably the best out of that bunch. But the team I'd probably watch out for is Buffalo because if Uka Pekalukanen can be the guy between the pipes that he's shown to be, and they do have flashes offensively with guys like Tage Thompson and Zach Benson. They have Rasmus Dahlin. They have Owen Power. They have Bowen Byram on the blue line, J.J. Paterka, Alex Tuck. They're, they're a team that's an up-and-coming team. Well, I don't know whether or not they're at the point they can make that next step, but they're going to be in that battle for that third or fourth playoff spot coming out of that division if they can get the goaltending that we've seen to date. All right. And then the Metropolitan, and, and we will have the futures to wrap up. Uh, we've got about another 10, 12 minutes here with Jan. So taking a look here, uh, of course, you got the Devils. A lot of people expected the Devils last year, but this happens a lot in sports. When you get that young team, that up and coming team, and then everybody expects this is the year. And uh, no, it's not this year, it's next year. And of course, uh, adding Brodor was a huge move. I mean, uh, Markstrom was a huge move. Yeah, Brodor with the Devils. Uh, adding Markstrom was a great move for the Devils uh, to solidify the back end. Of course, Carolina's Carolina with Brenda Moore. They're the Rangers. Uh, besides that, I know Washington's hanging in there, and it's a great story. Everybody's going to be paying attention to the Capitals here uh, in the coming days. Uh, but other than that, it, it, is it still right now the Devils, the, the Hurricanes, and the Rangers as they're going to separate themselves, or is there is there a fourth team? No, I think those are the top three. Um, like I said, Washington will be a story because Ovechkin, we know, is chasing Gretzky's record, right? And that's going to be a continuous story. They're getting really solid net mining for the most part, not as, as good as it was last year. When Charlie Lindgren had that magical season, but they added Logan Thompson um, from Washington, from sorry, Vegas, and you pair him with Lindgren, and it's a pretty solid one two punch. Though clearly Thompson has wow. had the better season of the two, right? As being undefeated so far this year. Um, Dylan Strom has a, a, a working chemistry. Um, Alexei Protas and Connor McMichael are probably the two biggest reasons why I think there's optimism in Washington. They, they're providing that secondary scoring that was lacking in the past. McMichael was a first-round pick. They tried him at center. He didn't necessarily stand out. They moved him to left wing on that first line, and all of a sudden, he's become magical. Protoss also was a first-round pick. He's become great. And then 
Pierre Luc Dubois, they acquired um, in a deal of con basic contract for contract with Darcy Kemper going out to LA. He gives them some depth at that second line center, but I do still think it's still still the top three in that division. And you know, Devils, you mentioned Bar Markstrom, but to me, the two probably biggest acquisitions this year was trading Alexander Holt to Vegas for Paul Cotter, and then also signing Stefan Nosen, who had been in Carolina. And those two guys are scoring way beyond what you expect, but they've really solidified that third line. They've provided New Jersey with a third line with Eric Halla. That's a pretty darn good third line that can be physical. They can contribute offensively. But more importantly, they take a little bit of the pressure off the top two lines that's there. He's sure and Hughes, we know how good each of them are at center. But now you now have a third line that can provide some support to bolster what you get out of the first two lines, which was kind of lacking in Jersey last year. All right. And uh, Carolina, the Rangers, of course, they were uh, – and, and I would imagine they're still uh, – veteran teams that have been in the postseason recently and are trying to make that next step uh are things going the way they're supposed to be going right now for both of those teams well i'd say for carolina right so freddie anderson's been injured piotr kachetkov has been their number one a guy they think is going to be the number one but the jury's still out a little bit as to whether or not he's a true number one um the thing they did is they added a power play captain shane gostaspear who takes a little pressure off of Brent Burns. And Burns is actually, his game has slipped substantially. Over the last couple of years, ironically, they added Jack Roslovic from the Rangers. And Roslovic, who couldn't score with an open net for the most part in New York, ended up getting eight goals already. Um, but what's really been a key is Martin ne 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 Martin Nickus, who's been a guy we've talked about, we've talked about a lot for years, waiting to take that next step. I think he's got a 10-game point streak right now. He's been great. Seth Jarvis has been very good. We know how good Svechnikov can be when he's healthy. Um, and also you're getting some production of Jesperi Kokoniemi, right? They signed to that big offer sheet. Then he signed the long-term deal and literally faded to oblivion last year. But this year, especially over the last probably three to four weeks, he's really found his game. And that's provided them a really good solid second line. And that was a big weakness coming into the year. What would their second line be? But now you got a pretty good second line with Karkiniemi and Nekis as their second line. And you've also gotten some production from Jordan Martinuk. Um, with the Rangers, great start. Fa started kind of off a house of fire, and then they went 4-4. Four and four. There's, It's ironic. They're 10-4-1, and one, and there's probably more questions than answers right now. I mean, including what's wrong with Mika Zabinijad. He got his first goal in like forever tonight. Um, one concerning thing is Philip Hedl had a collision with Keandre Miller tonight and left with an upper body injury. So clearly given his concussion woes, that's been a big issue, especially since the Hedl, Will Cooley, and Capo Caco line has probably been the Rangers' most consistent as a trio. Peter Laviolette has tried anything to get the top six going, moving Panarin and Lafreniere with Zabinijad, swapping Kreider and Laf on another line, trying to get some stuff going, and then they've had some massive issues on the blue line in terms of the performance of everybody except probably for Zach Jones and Braden Schneider. Fox has been fine, but Ryan Lindgren's been brutal. Keandre Miller's been had a rough start. Jacob Trubers had a rough start. So, as I said, there's the times. They're 10-4-1, and one, but if you ask any Ranger fan, it's probably doom and gloom because they've looked pretty horrific the last three weeks after a really good start. But I'd still say probably those three teams are probably the class of the Metro Division. And is Washington the clear number four if there is a number four, or is it pretty wide open? Rule out Columbus. Okay. Kind of rule out Pittsburgh. I think okay. Philly's still in a growth mode. I think they overachieved early last year, and then as we saw, faded late. Okay. There's still some young talent there. Um, I think between the pipes is still a little bit up in the air as to whether or not they really have a goalie of the future. The Islanders, I think the biggest question there is can they score enough to win, right? We know how good Ilya Sorokin is, but um, moving forward from there, I'm not quite sure if they have the breadth and depth of the scoring. I mean, we know Barton Bar uh, Matty Barzell is really good. We know how good how much good of a year Kyle Palmieri had last year, kind of over his head. Bo Horvat, Maxim siplikov has been good coming over from the KHL. He's kind of solidified things, but I think when you get past there, there's clearly some issues in terms of who's actually going to score beyond when you get past the primary line or so. Okay, so we'll wrap up by taking a look at those futures. Uh, and um, tell you what, let's uh, 
let's uh, go with the East. Okay, because pretty much what we're going to do is double these uh, for, uh, or I should say, um, uh, cut them off by 50%, and there you've got your, your uh, odds. I mean, double them, yeah, double them, excuse me. Okay, so uh, no surprise uh, that the Panthers are up front here. Um, what do you think about the way this board looks? Uh, you got these top six. These are the favorites right here based on the odds. Uh, it's, it's a little bit too early, you would think, but let's take a look here. Let's go in se quick sections. These four, between four and five to one, uh, who, if you had to take one of these four right now, who would you take? Florida. No question. Okay. To win back to back and be in three straight Stanley Cup finals. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's now move on to uh, the second tier. Uh, let's talk about this one here. Uh, let's talk about Lightning, Devils, Bruins. Pick a Devils. team. No, I mean, the thing that we, we talked about in the past, right? We knew they needed a goalie. They now have a goalie. I mean, you being a Canucks fan, you saw a lot of Jacob Markstrom when he was in yeah. Calgary. Um, regressed a little bit last year, but has clearly been rejuvenated and it's got a good young defense in front of him. Still think they may need a little help in terms of their blue line, but Jonathan Kovacevic and jo Jonas Siegenthaler have been really good for them. So good that Simon Nemec has been sent down to the minors and he's a big prospect for them. So New Jersey seems to have everything. Um, I do think they'll add a bit more bite to their fourth line a little bit at times. They they have a lot of skill up front, right? And all it comes down, I think, with New Jersey is can Jack Hughes stay healthy? Right? The problem is historically he has not been. If he can, given the talent around him and the talent that he has, New Jersey is a team that could make a long run knowing that they now have a true number one goalie. All right. And then as far as the long shots, Washington, Islanders, Ottawa, Detroit, and Buffalo – uh, which one is even uh, if you had to pick one and, 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 and you had some money, who would you put it on? Um, probably going Washington. I just think the, I think the Ovechkin hunt will keep them interesting this year. And if they get close, I wouldn't be shocked if they kind of spend a little cash to try to um, take, make it make, give Ovechkin kind of one more shot at the cup. So Panthers eight to one. Uh, you also like the Devils at sixteen to one, and uh, Washington at fifty to one. Yeah, if you're taking a shot on a deep, deep shot, yeah, fifty to one is sure. not a bad odds to take. Yeah, I guess so. With Ovechkin, it's amazing. And some people might look at it in some situations and go, "Ah, he's just hanging on because he wants the record." But that does not seem to be the case with him, man. If if, if you'd have asked me that the first three months of the season last year, I think yeah. everybody would have said that because he was brutal. Then yeah, I think he got twenty three goals his last thirty seven games last year, and clearly has carried that forward to this year. Crazy. All right, so uh, tell uh, our audience, and we're going to have links in the description. But tell our audience uh, where they can find your work and and when that work is available. Sure. So. Hockey news um, varies by day. Um, myself and one other person kind of post, kind of almost like DFS type target guys um, for the for their fantasy columns every day. Um, they're up seven days a week between myself and one other individual on their on the fantasy part of the hockey news. Uh, Rotowire, I do a weekly column on risers and fallers, and also have also do their updates of all their cheat sheets for the entire season. And then hockeybuzz.com, I cover the Rangers. So usually, obviously, column post game, um, but usually later that night or the next morning after a game, and then a game day preview, uh, leading them, leading us into kind of the next game. And then clearly associated with that is some analysis of the games and then analysis of the team as a whole. Jan, appreciate it. We'll talk Western Conference next week. And if anybody has any questions, comments, anything like that, you can leave it in the uh, description. Uh, excuse me, in the comment section, of course, uh, and we will uh, bring it up on our uh, upcoming shows. So, Jan, appreciate your time. Thanks, Greg. Looking forward to it. You got it.